Hello, we're going to be in Acts chapter, uh, the end of chapter 4 and all of chapter 5 today. It's a rather unusual account. It's an account about temporal judgment, an account of the awesomeness of God that fell in this early community. I'm not sure that what happened here is normative for every church and every day, because if it is, I think we'd all be dead. But it does show that God was concerned about the purity and the respect uh, and the credibility of his early church, and I think he still is. As the fourth chapter begins to conclude in, in verse 32, it's kind of a summary statement. We find these summaries characteristically through Acts. There was one back in chapter 2, verses 43 through 47. There'll be one in chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. It's kind of a way of the author catching us up historically and moving on to uh, a little different aspect, sometimes the same account as in chapter 5. Now, there was but one heart and one soul and a vast number of those who had become believers. And not one of them had claimed anything to be his own, but shared everything they had as common property. Some of them said, well, this is the first uh, biblical uh, proof text for communism. No. This is the early church's attempt to fund its ministry. It was a voluntary, mutual thing that because of some problems did not work out and was abandoned and never became the norm for the early church. Matter of fact, it seems here that many of the early church had some money, but very early in Acts, back in Acts 11, matter of fact, the church in Jerusalem is very poor and Paul has to take a contribution for her. So if they did try this, they ran out of funds very quickly. Notice it begins then, so with great power, the apostles continued to give their testimony to the resurrection. Isn't it unusual? These men were cowards just a few days before. Oh, the power of the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And it was a power not to lift up men, but a power to proclaim the gospel. That's what they've been doing. Every time they're filled, they preach the word. And here they are with great power sharing the testimony of the resurrection. The classical definitive passage on the resurrection is 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul puts it so succinctly. If the resurrection is not true historically, the Christian faith is a joke. For our faith is that Jesus Christ was God in human form and that death could not hold him. And because it could not hold him, it cannot hold us. It's God's stamp of approval on the life, the teachings, the death of Jesus Christ. Notice it continues here, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, Old Testament title for the covenant God. Jesus, from Matthew 1.21, Yahweh saves. God's favor rested richly on them all. For none of them was in want. Now, we learn chapter 11, the church became very poor. As for many of them, they were owners of farms and houses, proceeded to sell them one by one, and continued to bring the money received for the things sold, and put it at the disposal of the apostles. Notice the great respect the apostles are having. Uh, then distribution was continuously made to everyone in proportion to his need. Now, we'll continue this the, the problem that happened even with the distribution not just the giving, but how to distrib uh, distribute it out in Acts chapter 6. Now Joseph, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas. Now it's kind of a popular etymology that means son of encouragement. And if you'll get your concordance and look up Barnabas, every time you find him, he's always doing something like that. He was a great encourager. I'm really looking forward to meet this guy. I want to meet Barnabas and... Uh, I want to meet uh, Peter's brother, Andrew. Boy, what great hearts they seem to be in the New Testament. Notice it says, which means son of encouragement, sold the farm. Now the word here is uh, really possibly could mean burial plot because that's the way this Greek word is used. And so maybe it was a family burial plot that he sold. And he brought the money and put it at the disposal of the apostles. Now in chapter 5. But a man named Ananias, which means God has graciously given... Uh, and his wife, Sapphira, which means beautiful, Aramaic for beautiful. Now, you know, Ananias and Sapphira, I, I love F.F. F. Bruce's commentary so much. In his commentary on Acts in the New International Commentary series that I recommend so highly, he says that Ananias was to the early church what Achan was to the book of Joshua. And I think that's very true because some of the terms here used in the early part of chapter 5 reflect back to words used in the Septuagint of Achan's account. Notice it mentions here. Sold a piece of property. Nothing wrong with that. And with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back for themselves a part of the money. Now, they had the right to give what they wanted to give. They were not under compulsion to give all. 
but they wanted a reputation like Barnabas. They wanted people to look on them spiritually more than they really are. God help us, if we killed everybody who wanted today, we'd wipe out half the church. We're all playing this little church game, acting a certain way in front of people, trying to say, oh boy, we're really spiritual. And I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit knocked them dead over it. It wasn't because they didn't give it all. They didn't have to give it all. It's because of this arrogant attitude that wanted to puff up themselves in front of people. God help us. This is serious. Now, notice what happened. Um, and Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan so completely possessed your heart? If there is any place in the New Testament where the evil one has some influence in the life of a believer, well, there's two of them, really, and we wonder sometimes if they're really saved. One of them is a magician. But this guy is obviously a Christian. I don't think there's any doubt that Ananias and Sapphira are truly redeemed, that they are were truly members of the church. So here we have an example of temporal judgment. We also have an example of the evil one by Peter being said to completely possess. Now the word here is the word filled. As they are filled with the Holy Spirit, the apostles over and over, here is a Christian that's filled with the evil one. Is that possible? I guess it is. And the judgment of God fell on him. Notice it says, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. Now, he lied to Peter. But the trick is, the, it was the Holy Spirit's church. And kept back for yourselves a part of the money received for the land. As long as it was unsold, was it not yours? And when it was sold, was it not the money at your disposal? All these are yes questions. How could it be that your heart to do such a thing, do you not lie to men but to God? Notice, theologically, very important. The Holy Spirit mentioned in verse uh, 3 is identified here as God. Here is a great passage that the Spirit is, a, is truly separate from the Father, but the same essence as the Father. This is one of those places where we begin to see some of the, uh, the Trinitarian concepts of the Bible coming out. Jesus is presented as being truly divine. The Holy Spirit is seen to be an actual personality separate from Jesus and the Father. Now, we don't believe in three gods in Christianity. We believe in one God with three persons, and that's what we seem to have here. Notice if you would where it says, and Ananias heard these words, he fell dead. Now, was it a heart attack? Was it fear? Or was it the judgment of God? I don't think we have enough information. But I want to tell you this, it certainly was the judgment of God falling. In my notes, I've given you some passages where I think the New Testament does teach that Christians who get away from the Lord in extraordinary ways and bring reproach on his kingdom sometimes are called home early. And I think you might want to run those references when you have a little more time. Notice it says then, And the younger men, however, got up, wrapped up his body, carried him out, and buried it. About three hours later, his wife came in without having learned what had taken place. Now, she may have been in the area. Maybe she was out of pocket. Some, some kind of blamed Peter for not telling her more gently. But Peter must, through the prophecy of the Holy Spirit, been told this kind of conspiracy was going on. And so he confronts her. And Peter said to her, Tell me, did you sell the land for such and such a sum? She lied again. Yes, that was it. And Peter said to Hood, How could you both agree in such a way? Now look at the word here in your New Testament, verse 4, um, excuse me, verse 9, to test the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord. This word test, there are two words in Greek for test. There is a word that means to test with a view toward approval. That's what God does to his people. There is a word that means to test with a view toward destruction. That's the word here. Without even knowing it, they were testing God by lying. Wow. Notice here it says, the Spirit of the Lord. Now again, this is one of those other classical passages where the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the ministry of Jesus are closely woven together. Matter of fact, I think it's eight, uh, Romans 8, 17, that the Holy Spirit's called the Spirit of Jesus. There are several passages like that. There is much fluidity. The, the Spirit brings to mind the things of the Son. I guess the uh, classical passage on the work of the Holy Spirit is John chapter 14 through 16. You might want to see that. She also dies, and they carried her out. So a strange awe seized the whole church and, every, and everybody who heard it. I guess it did. Mercy sakes. Now, this is the first use of the word church in the book of Acts. It means the called out ones, implication, the divinely called out ones, ek, out of, kaleo, to call. It is used in the Septuagint to translate the congregation of Israel. The early church picked this term because they saw themselves as the fulfillment and continuation of the Old Testament covenant people. 
Now in verse 12, we have another summary statement. And many signs and wonders were continuously performed by the apostles among the people. And by common consent, they all used to meet in Solomon's portico. Now these signs and wonders in the ministry of the apostles seems to be a way to very rapidly and very quickly among the Jewish people and the Gentiles confirm the gospel message. It's often been said that when the canon was finished or the apostles died, these miraculous signs and wonders passed away. But I think that's assuming way too much. If we believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, and I do, these miraculous signs and wonders and miracles and healings are performed throughout. Now, we don't know why some and not others. We don't know why in the church has kind of gone down some as far as intensity. But I really think the two times of miracles intensity were around the birth of the Messiah and his death and the beginning of the early church. And I think there's kind of a lull in that until right before the second coming when there's an intensification of evil and I think an intensification of gifts of the Spirit. But I want to say this to you. I think they're present and valid right now. And the real question is, why aren't they more active in my church? I think because we all have such little faith. Notice here, it also mentions they, were, they met by common consent in Solomon's portico, which says what? They continued in the temple service. At this point, they were not a separate entity. They were just kind of a, a group of Jews with a little different belief about the Messiah had already come, but they weren't separate yet from Judaism. Now, Solomon's portico is the place where Jesus taught, John 10, 23. It's on the eastern side of the outer court, the court of the uh, women, I believe. That's where it was. And this, of course, was where the people taught, and there was a lot more milling around. Uh, Herod's the one that, outer, that had these outer courts. They weren't back in, the, in Solomon's temple or the second temple. Now, verse 13. Not one of those who were outside dared to associate with them. Again, the awesomeness and the respect of Ananias and Sapphira's death not only tended to purify the church in this half-hearted commitment, this taking the name of God and his church lightly, but it also made those who were outside the church respect the power of God among this group. Although the, peop the people continued to hold them in high regard. That was one reason the, the uh, Sanhedrin was afraid of the apostles. Verse 14, but still a vast number of people, both men and women, who believe in the Lord continued to join them. And this is a passive tense. It's the idea of the Spirit bringing them in. So the, the church is growing rapidly, even with this kind of a very uh, deep commitment required. Now, notice it continues to say, let's see, uh, verse 15, so that they kept bringing out into the street the sick ones and putting them on little couches and pallets um, that at least the shadow of Peter as he went by might fall on some of them. Now, this is somewhat unusual. This is not normative. But I think it shows the power of God that was active through these men. It's obvious through here that Peter is the spokesman for the apostolic group. And here we have even his shadow falling on people. I can't explain all that. I don't know exactly how God does that. I do this account of what happened. I know that handkerchiefs from Paul were taken to the sick. And so it's simply God performing and confirming the ministry of Peter in a very unusual way. Even from the towns around Jerusalem, crowd continues to come in and bring their sick ones and those troubled with foul spirits, uh, demon-possessed. And there's a real distinction in the New Testament between those who are physically ill and those who are demon-possessed, although the characteristics of both sometimes coincide. And they were all cured. Now, this all cured is it, amazing in its intensity. It seems to say that everyone who was brought to the apostles was cured. Now, that's unusual because, for example, back in Acts chapter 1, verses 32 through 34, uh, Jesus did not heal everybody brought to him, but it says many demons were cast out and many were healed. It's this level of intensity. I hear people say, well, if you just had enough faith, Jesus would heal every problem. I just have problems with that level of intensity. I don't think it's always the will of God for everyone to be healed. I remember that Paul had a thorn in the flesh. He prayed with great faith. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, and was not healed. I remember that Paul had a sick helper, Trophimus, but he prayed and could not heal him and had to leave him sick. Uh, so I believe it was Ephesus where he left him, but I'm, I'm not sure of that. You might want to check these other scripture texts out before you make any radical statements here. But I do believe that God is a supernatural God, and he still heals. Now the high priest took a stand, and all his friends, the party of the Sadducees, and being filled with jealousy, notice here, you're either filled with the Holy Spirit, you're filled with Satan, you're filled with jealousy. I wonder what you're filled with tonight. The Bible says man can be filled with many things. Jealousy, hate, rage, anger, lust. You know, in reality, we're filled with one of two things. We're filled with the power of God 
for the purpose of sharing and growing and being the people of God or we're filled with the evil one. The implication here is even somebody who's saved from, at times can be filled. It's kind of who we yield to, isn't it? Now, notice if you would, where it mentions, uh, they were all filled with jealousy. The, the idea here is to boil with emotions, right? Boy, it's intense. They had the apostles arrested and put them in common jail. But that night, the angel of the Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is uh, sometimes the pre-incarnate Christ. We see it so clearly in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, the angel of the Lord was in the burning bush, and it says God spoke out of the bush. But here it just seems to be a, a, an angel came and let Peter out of prison. Now you say, well, why didn't he let James out? Well, that's one of the mysteries. Let Peter out and Peter saved, but James is in jail a few uh, chapters later, and James dies. It's the mystery of God. It's the same mystery about why some are healed and some aren't. It's the same mystery about why didn't the church had this kind of power today. Maybe we're crippled by the spirit of Ananias and Sapphira still. Maybe a few deaths in our membership wouldn't be half bad. Go take uh, your stand in the temple square and continue to tell the people. And here the angel tells them to proclaim. He's released to proclaim. The message of this new life. This is the word zoe. It's used characteristically in John for this supernatural resurrection kind of life. They obeyed and began to preach. And the Sadducees said, where are they? And they went back and the, the doors were securely locked like nothing had happened. Guards were still in place. But the men were gone. Sanhedrin thought that someone had let them out or something. And they say, well, hey, they're right out here in the temple preaching. They sent the temple police. They didn't grab them by the arm, I guarantee. They said, would you come with us, please, sir? <laughs> and they did. And they took them and put them before the council, right? They, because look at verse 30, uh, 26. The council was still afraid of the people because they were held in high regard, the apostles in the early church. And the high priest said to them, did we not positively forbid you to teach any more on this authority, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings. What a testimony to the power and pervasiveness of this early apostolic preaching after they had been so afraid before Pentecost. And now I want, you want to bring on us the people's vengeance for this man's death. This, this man is kind of a way of bringing some reproach on Jesus' name. They never name him the Sanhedrin. It's always this man's death. And I, I think we see that. It's almost the Talmud calls Jesus that so-and-so. And you see the, the insult there. And they were bringing some reproach on the Jewish leaders for, that, for his death, for they're the ones in cahoots with the Romans that caused it. And Peter and the apostles, meaning the group there, answered them, We must, dia, moral necessity, obey God rather than men. The God of our forefathers raised Jesus to life. Boy, he's just saying right to them, I, the covenant God of the Old Testament, the God you claim to know, he's the one that raised Jesus from the dead. How can we listen to you when there's a resurrected man here? Raise Jesus to life after you. Boy, whoo, 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 put the finger around his nose. Hanged him on the cross. Remember, this goes back to Deuteronomy 21, 23, where they wanted to curse Jesus by having him crucified. That's what Galatians 3, 13 says. Jesus became a curse on our behalf. He was cursed with the law, but he was sinless, and his death was for our benefit and not for his own. And killed him. God has exalted him to his right hand. Wow. This is the idea. Now, of course, right hand, anthropomorphic phrase. But Jesus in the place of authority and power, the very one they killed, God has glorified, resurrected. Boy. To be leader, mean the first, the author. And savior, that was the, used for the Caesars, very important title for God in the pastoral epistles and also for Jesus. In order that, number one, to give repentance, and number two, forgiveness of sins to Israel. That's why Jesus died, the substitutionary atonement. He died for sinful man. Implication, even for you, Sanhedrin, if you would just turn to him. We and the Holy Spirit that God has given to those who practice obedience. Now, notice that. Obedience is an aspect of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I like what Jesus said in Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? and do not the things I tell you to do. Yes, obedience is a channel for the power of the Holy Spirit. Obedience is not a key to being saved, for we're saved by the grace of God. But once we're saved by the grace of God, we need to walk in the grace of God, which is we respond in repentance, faith, and obedience to his word. Notice it says, and you are witnesses these things. He wasn't telling them anything they didn't know about uh, Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, they had paid off the temple police to say, tell him that, the, that he was stolen, tell him that somebody came and got his body. They know what happened, that the angel came and the tomb is empty. 
but they're blind. Satan, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4 has blinded their mind, made them filled with jealousy. They can't even see. It's the unpardonable sin. Now, when they heard this, they became furious, literally cut to the heart, and they wanted to kill them. That's nothing new for them. They killed Jesus. They would, they had Stephen killed. Why would it be bother them to kill a few more? A Pharisee named Gamaliel. This is a really important Pharisee. Gamaliel, we know from Acts 22.3, was Paul's teacher. Uh, he was the grandson of Hillel, a very important rabbi. The two schools of Shammai and Hillel were the conservative and liberal schools of that day. This man seems to be a great thinker. Uh, notice what he says here. I think in the mouths of even unbelievers, God sometimes puts tremendous message as he did earlier during the crucifixion in Caiaphas' mouth. A teacher of the law, uh, highly respected by all the people. The Talmud says, written later, there has not been a righteous person uh, in, in the order of uh, Gamaliel. Got up in the council and gave orders to put the men out of the council for a little while. The question is, I wonder how, the apostle, I wonder how uh, Luke knew about what was said in the council. Well, you think Nicodemus was there? You think Joseph of Arimathea was there? You think a few others had believed? Oh, I think so. I think so. And when he said to them, fellow Israelites, take care of what you do about this man. For in days gone by, now Thudius, and I'm not sure uh, who this guy is exactly, we have some recollections of a person like this, uh, but it's uncertain really who they're referring to. We know of a couple of events in history that fit this, but we're not sure that that's the exact ones here claiming to be a man of some importance and considerable number of men, about 400 espoused his cause, but he was slain and all his followers were dispersed uh, as a, and as a party annihilated. Um, there's another one here, and after that time, and an, the enrollment tax. This is another census. Now, the first census we, is mentioned in Luke 2.2, 2, and it happened 14 years earlier. But this one apparently is a second census. It happened in A.D. Uh, 6 through 8, okay? Judas the Galilean. Now, we know of something in this from history. He was a zealot, and this happened in 6 AD, this revolt, and you can read about it in Flavius Josephus, The Antiquities of the Jews. Appeared and influenced people to the desert to follow him. I think this is the one that said he was going to split the Jordan River <laughs> and walk across dry shod. So in the present case, I warn you, stay away from these men. Let them alone, for if this program or movement has its origin in men, it's from human uh, a source, it will go to pieces. But if it has its origin in God, you can never stop it. Oh, boy, out of the mouths even of an unbeliever comes great power. If it's of, if it's of men, it's not going to last. But if it's of God, this movement's still here today. Do you know that, friend? Still strong, still powerful, still witnessing. I think it's of God. It is to be feared that you may find yourselves fighting against God. And they were, they were convinced by him after calling the apostles in, had them flogged. Now, this is not the flogging as Jesus received. The Roman flogging was so cruel, many people died under it. This is the beating with rods of Deuteronomy 25.3. Uh, it was 39 lashes with a rod. Paul says he had had this several times, too, in that uh, 2 Corinthians 11 passage. So it wasn't a terrible beating, but it was a beating. And who wants to get hit with a rod 39 times on your back, bare back? They charged them to stop speaking in the authority of Jesus, and they turned them loose. So they went out from the presence of the council, sad and looking for liniment. No. They went out rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer disgrace for Jesus' name. Oh, friends, there's something about the persecution because we're Christian that's so powerful. It's not the unusual, it's the norm. Oh, read 1 Peter 4, 12 through 18. Well, why does it surprise you when fiery ordeals come upon you as though some strange thing were happening to you? If we live for Jesus in a fallen world, we're going to be persecuted. We're going to be ostracized. God help us, the very fact we're not having any flack probably reveals the quality and depth of our spiritual lives. And not, and not for a single day did they stop teaching in the temple square and in private houses the good news of Jesus, the Messiah. The fellowship was growing. It was growing in public, the temple, every day, preaching, teaching. Solomon's portico, that's where the rabbis taught. It was growing in home meetings. We learned from other pastors, they were breaking bread and fellowship. The apostles 
were authoritative, distributing to the needs of the people. The power of God was moving in healings and in judgment. An awe settled. Oh, to God that the church today had that kind of power. But I wonder if we know how to use it in our day of big buildings, and fancy titles, and big programs. Maybe we don't need the power of God. Or God help us, maybe that's just what we need. Maybe that's just what we need. Well, I hope you'll read back through this. It says a word to us about sin in the life of the church. It says to us about believers possibly being filled by the evil one. It says to us that temporal judgment occurs even still. And it says to us we've lost something of our power. Maybe because we've been identified with society instead of persecuted by our society. May we be different. May our testimony fill our towns as this early apostolic preachings filled theirs. <laughs> May it be so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I've enjoyed being with you. See you again, same time, same place, next week. God bless you.